This is World Insight with me, Tianwei. We begin with the spike in COVID infections. Confirmed cases worldwide are approaching 500 million with over 6 million deaths, according to latest data from John Hopkins University. The Chinese mainland pulls out all the stops to battle an infection spike with a new spike in recent days, particularly with the latest number on Tuesday. Two areas in particular are struggling, the mega city of Shanghai and the northeastern province of Jilin in Shanghai, the great majority of cases relatively benign, with most of them asymptomatic carriers. How well is the city and China dealing with the situation? Has the time come for China to focus on easing its COVID measures? What could be the end of the game for the pandemic? For deeper insights, we are joined in by panelists from different parts of the world. For more on the recent pandemic surge, we are joined in New York, Dr. Robin Moon, who is an adjunct associate professor from the City University of New York, a graduate school of public health and health policy. In San Francisco, Monica Gandhi, a professor of medicine at the University of Carolina, San Francisco. And in Nanjing, last but not least, Wu Zhiwei, director from the Center for Public Health Research of the Medical School of Nanjing University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. The numbers are skyrocketing, as we know. Uh, a lot of countries have already eased uh, their restrictions, uh, mainly due to various reasons of their own choices. Now, uh, Dr. Wu, the world's attention, of course, is on China. How do you look at the latest uh, spike, particularly the huge number of asymptomatic cases? Well, this is a definitely a huge challenge with a big city like Shanghai with 25 million population. And we have seen that uh, Shanghai has, uh, has been uh, steadily increasing in the confirmed cases and the asymptomatic uh, cases as well. So um, I, I think, you know, uh, in the next few days, we, you will still see a dramatic increase, although the city is sealed down. Uh, initially by, um, you know, two different parts uh, uh, along the uh, Wampu River, but still that um, so far we see uh, there is no abating in, in the number of new cases. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a tremendous problem because uh, this indicating that, that the uh, unnoticed infection has been going on for quite a while. So that's why you see in uh, many different communities, there is a very serious infection as well. So this is a, a definitely a big challenge in, uh, in dealing with the, the spreading of the virus. Mm, I understand. Mr. Wu, if I could just follow up, uh, uh, we see the asymptomatic cases increases now, even with the uh, shift to hospitals over there being built right now in Shanghai, very unlikely to accommodate all of the possible future asymptomatic cases and therefore uh, how do you see the policies are likely to be adjusted according to the realities on the ground now of course it's too early to say that but we can see when numbers increase they increase dramatically they increase with a, a mathematical way well, you see, um, we see a, a, a huge number of asymptomatic uh, cases. I think, you know, it's uh, probably is a bad idea you, you concentrate them all in this um, in uh, this hospital facilities because you're basically building up a, a tremendous human pool. And that actually, if somebody uh, converted into an uh, um, uh, confirm the cases, then um, the, the situation could be getting worse. Mm. Uh, most of those people in Shanghai, we know that they are either uh, no symptoms or they are uh, very minor um, uh, symptoms. So there is basically, they don't need any medical uh, uh, intervention. What all they need is basically you, you provide a certain monitoring to prevent the developing into severe cases. So uh, I think this is very critical that we need to think in a different way, not that, you know, completely getting rid of a virus. We mm. have to understand that this virus is going to stay with us. Mm. And now we also see different uh, scenarios and different uh, uh, solutions in other countries of choices. Uh, both of the other two guests are right now situated in, located in the United States. Uh, 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 Professor Gandhi and Dr. Uh, Moon, tell me more about what do you make of the various choices uh, uh, countries take at this moment? 
Uh, maybe we start with uh, Dr. Moon first. Uh, yes, we as a country um, are looking at the data um, that's mostly limited to the acute care systems, so the hospitals, the hospitalizations, the ventilators, uh, which is extremely important. If you remember two years ago in New York City, we had a very, very difficult um, time uh, in the hospital systems then. But we also need to be looking at the social economic, social uh, factors, um, and that is um, not being looked at in terms of um, easing the restrictions um, and you know wearing masks and you know what mm. we do with our school children and and, and so on. Um, it feels to me um, it's a little too early to really re uh, repeal all of the mask wearing policy. Um, that is a small price to pay, um, you know, compared to all other difficulties we have experienced so far. Mm -hmm. And now there is an argument, which is a valid argument for school children, young school children, to you know, have not be able to see the mouth, you know, uh, movement in speeches and uh, speech and, and you know, cognitive development. Um, but I think making a blanket uh, policy to repeal all of the mask wearing um, across the country is mm -hmm. a mistake at this point. I see. So you have your own debate within uh, the country and your city as well. The other city, of, uh, the other state, of course, uh, California, has been heavily hit also uh, years ago by the pan by the pandemic. The situation has been evolving. What about the latest uh, from you, uh, Professor Gandhi? You are based in San Francisco. Um, well, yes, I agree that the United States has really started to focus on severe disease and preventing severe disease. So the focus now, even in any non-pharmaceutical intervention, including mask wearing, is on hospitalizations. We are at our lowest point of hospitalization since spring mm -hmm. of 2020. Um, and so we, and actually most countries have taken a different approach than COVID zero, um, which unfortunately is impossible to obtain. It isn't um, because of human behavior. It actually has to do with the virus behavior that it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to get a virus out of the country when it's contained in animals. There's animal reservoirs. There are essentially, it's a long infectious period. It looks like other respiratory pathogens and our vaccines are not sterilizing. Mm. And so unfortunately, those are the four reasons why we can't eradicate COVID. Right. And so the, the rest of the world has sort of moved towards focusing on preventing severe disease with vaccines and then therapeutics for those who are immunocompromised mm. or declined to the vaccine. Mm. Now, Dr. Wu, since we talk about the vaccine, this is very crucial. Uh, many of the asymptomatic cases that you have uh, observed, uh, both in Shanghai and Zilin also, uh, are those who have already got the vaccines. In China, the vaccine rate is also relatively high, except among senior populations. It's very tough because some of them have some basic diseases that's very hard for them to be inoculated. So tell me more, Dr. Wu, about uh, uh, your confidence of vaccines at this point. Now, there's already talk about the third uh, and even the fourth uh, inoculation of vaccines in China. What do you make of the prospect while well, the country is also, you know, struggling with this uh, 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 current situation while maintaining still dynamic COVID policy? Well, the vaccine, we know that it definitely would provide a certain protections, but it's not sterilizing, as uh, Dr. Gandhi just mentioned. Uh, we all understood that. And uh, as the uh, vaccination uh, uh, people who are vaccinated, actually, when the time goes by, the vaccine's efficacy will go down. Mm -hmm. But uh, from the clinical, we have seen that the people who received the vaccine, they, they, they fell much better than those who do not uh, receive the vaccine. So basically, vaccine is effective in reducing the severe cases. So uh, from this point, that I think the booster shots would uh, help people to build up or strengthen their immunity, provide a better uh, protection um, uh, for the people who are actually uh, getting infected. So uh, I think you know, in this sense, the vaccine is still effective in terms of reducing the severe cases. Mm. So I would encourage people who are actually 
uh, re received two uh, those those vaccines would receive the third one and uh, for those senior elderly people who have not received vaccine uh, i think it's very critical for them to receive the uh, the vaccine uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, if, if it's impossible. We have seen in Hong Kong the situation that mm. one of the key reasons why elderly people have uh, suffering such a high death rate is that many of the people did not receive the vaccine or they did not receive the complete vaccination. Yeah. The rate of vaccination in Hong Kong is very low compared to many other countries and regions, uh, 20 to 30 percent. So that's very low at this point. Uh, we look at things you talk about Hong Kong. If I could just ask you a little bit further about Hong Kong. And now we see its uh, restrictions are being eased uh, to a certain extent. Now, it is still trying to uphold the earlier policy, but ease to a certain extent in Hong Kong. How, as a metropolitan city, as a global metropolitan city, is it likely to be an important case study also for China as a whole? Well, uh, Hong Kong is, uh, is a quite a special place. because Sure, uh, it's one country, it's two an, systems. It's governed uh, uh, differently. Yeah. It's in a very important international uh, goods transportation hub and also for uh, human transportation as well. So Hong Kong's uh, uh, COVID-19 prevention policy was uh, basically uh, between the mainland China and the Western countries. So it cannot completely seal it off or cannot completely lock down because there are, uh, you know, 7 million people who mm. heavily depend on Hong Kong's economic and the commercial activities. Mm. So, um, you know, uh, since uh, last year, and then now we think that Hong Kong basically uh, removed some of the restrictions, the situation is not getting worse. So uh, that actually indicates to us that uh, we do have a certain uh, leeway in terms of designing a new, more flexible policy based on the new uh, infection cases. All right. By, uh, uh, paying attention to the uh, highly uh, uh, vulnerable population and uh, uh, allow the the younger population who will receive also uh, receive the vaccines to okay. to have uh, normal economic or social activities. Right. Uh, we only have uh, about less than three minutes left, but this is very important question. Since a lot of countries already eased the restrictions on uh, prevention and control, how worried are we about a new variant that might be more? Uh, you know, spreading even more than uh, Omicron. Of course, all of these are scenarios. There are many scenarios we, we could look at. Uh, we understand that there are new variants already being studied. Uh, we do not know how fast it will spread, how serious it will become once it's really fast spreading among the population. Dr. Moon. Um, yeah, we don't have the evidence yet how dangerous this virus um, subvariant will be. Um, there's XE and XF as well. But I will say two things. One, as long as we have the inequitable vaccine distribution in the world, in mm -hmm. the globe, um, this uh, uh, evolvement of the virus will continue. So right now we have the entire continent of Africa and some other low-income countries under 15% of vac vaccination mm -hmm. and that's going to continue to provide the breeding ground for the virus to you know continue to ecologically release that's one and the other is um locking down and like really having severe restriction has its downside severe downside of economic um economic cost and you know those in the in the society with the social economic um uh, inferior social economic um level will be getting the brunt of it mm -hmm. so in terms of taking care of like you know and making the 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 treatment and then care and the prevention equitable mm -hmm. uh, while we all continue to have the prevention uh protect protection and safety measures I is see. critical. All right. Professor Gandhi, also, what do you think about the scenarios of new variants and how likely they to be uh, at this point? You know, the WHO released a plan just a week ago about how to deal with new variants moving forward. They mm -hmm. said that we have the baseline scenario right now where vulnerable people will need boosters. The best case scenario is we have a less virulent variant, in which case immunity will be created without boosters. And the worst case scenario is that we get a more virulent variant, in which case the entire planet, speaking to Dr. Moon's point, will need boosters. The entire planet will. So we have 
ways to mm. work on variants, even if a worst one comes along, right. because so far the, the vaccines have all worked against any variant that's come about because they create adaptive immunity okay. and we're able to use our current vaccines. We are running out of time and sorry, I would not have time for Dr. Wu to respond uh, uh, for now, but thank you so much for the three of you for joining us. Uh, Robin Moon, Monica Gandhi, Wu Zhuwei, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, all the best. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Coming up in the program, international efforts to improve food production amid the tight global supplies due to the Ukraine conflict. On that, we will hear from the president of the United Nations Fund for Agricultural Development. Next. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Food supply chains already disrupted amid the pandemic are now under new pressure from the conflict in Ukraine with potentially dire consequences for the world economy and food security. According to the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or EFAT, some 3 billion people already suffer from poor quality diets at a time of tight global food supplies. Improving production systems is at the heart of EFAT's work. On efforts to deal with all these challenges, I spoke to Gilbert Humble, who is the EFI president. Take a listen. Now I'm joined by Gilbert Humble, president of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EFAD. Last month, he was elected to the next director general of the International Labor Organization. Mr. President, first of all, congratulations on that new post. Thank you so much, and thank me for, for having me on your program. It's my great pleasure, sir. But meanwhile, you have to handle a food crisis while you are transforming your role to another important post. But tell me more about you know, the 2030 agenda by the United Nations about uh, eliminating extreme poverty and hunger. It seems that with a prolonged war, is it still possible? No, already, even before the war, um, and even before the, uh, the COVID-19, um, the, the SDG 1 and SDG 2, one is uh, end poverty and SDG 2, zero hunger, were already at risk of not being achieved by 2030. So the challenge was very high, which has led the Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, to call for a food system summit last year on that. So now COVID-19 has made the situation worse. And we are struggling with COVID, and now we have the conflict in uh, Ukraine, which in itself makes it even much more difficult for all of us, for the whole world. Because we just have to keep in mind that we have about 50, 50, 50 countries that depend on those two countries for at least 30% of their wheat or their grain import. So it's a serious matter. Mm. Are there specific countries that you are looking at the most these days, though, the one that's really the most being challenged? Yes, obviously we think about uh, neighboring countries um, to um, the, the whole international attention is how to help Ukraine um, harvest its current uh, um, um, production or start maintaining um, to the maximum possible the, um, uh, the normal production. Another um, element that is of, of concern for us is that the neighboring countries such as uh, Moldova, um, where in fact has a lot of uh, activity, activity there. Then we also have, as I was saying, uh, low income countries and lower middle income countries that we are serving and that are hit harder. I'm thinking about Egypt, I'm thinking about Algeria, I'm thinking about uh, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen. That have a huge dependency on import from those two um, two countries. Mm. But the global the global price uh, for the, the flour, for the bread, which is essentially used everywhere in most of the country, has gone up. And that is causing a social um, economic uh, challenges to every government. And that is also of concern. Mm. 
But Mr. President, many wonder how much is this uh, caused by the real war and the, the uh, inability to uh, transport uh, the productions from those two countries, mainly uh, Ukraine and Russia, to the rest of the world? Or is it uh, has a lot to do with the manipulation of the market by some interest groups uh, and as well by the sanction regime? I, I, will, I will want to believe, unfortunately, that is, uh, it, it's both on, on, on that. Uh, it's really a matter of shortage of production, given that those two countries, given the circumstances, the production may not be the same or the inability to export out of the, the countries and therefore the food waste and loss, one can imagine, has grown up. On the flip side, it's also known his, history is there to teach us lesson. It's also known that when you have crisis, unfortunately, you will always have specul speculation. You will always have manipulation mm. that will make the, uh, the, 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 the shortage um, much more intense and the, the increase in the price even worse than was then it should be yeah there is a rising concern about whether the world as a whole is still having consensus about the earlier rules about the earlier standards uh, whether it is scientific or humanitarian uh, and the list goes on so when you see there's tendency of some who is trying to through their actions emphasizing on the rules of the jungle what does that mean for the very nature of your organization and the people you are trying to help no um, for, for for us uh, if i had not been a humanitarian um organization but rather development focusing on the forest in the rural area tomorrow we don't know which crisis we're going to have the whole point, whether we, while we hope to be wrong, the whole point is that it's important for us to plan for potential other crises. And the only way to do that, this is what IFAD is really pushing for, the only way to do it is long-term investment. Investment that is really in the medium long run mm -hmm. by increasing and the, the, the national production, increasing um, the user friendly of the input, be it seed, be it water, so to preserve the environment and increasing um, the productivity through the use of basic technology. I'm not even talking about sophisticated one. Um, and, and finally, the transformation, so you know, to avoid the 30% of food waste and loss. So for us, it's really coming to those basic and make it big, make it to scale, bring it to scale. So tomorrow, when you have those crises, at least the food security can be assured. Point taken, Mr. President. But do you think you still have as many listeners as you used to be? I, I, I want to believe so. To be honest, I want to believe so. Out of uh, out of the, the the crisis of Ukraine, I, I I was humbled about a month ago to see how many member states, and particularly donor member states, have been calling us trying to see what are we proposing? What is the, the, the action plan? So there is a good um, will on that. But my point in which I'm pressing and that I fully agree with you, one thing is to express a good will. Another thing is to transform that good right. will into concrete action. Absolutely. This is where we need to strength, uh, put the, 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 the action on. Yeah, Mr. President, now, uh, particularly these days, uh, the, the developing countries and the emerging economies, particularly the developing countries, are facing a lot of dangers of, uh, you know, disruption of the supply chains and production chains. And uh, also, you see this trend uh, over the past few decades that whenever something like a huge crisis happens, the poorest and the lowest uh, income groups of the world suffered the most, than, much more than the top layer. So uh, when you see another crisis like the Russia-Ukraine, you know, is, have we learned a lesson about how to provide a better help to that lowest level of uh, uh, income groups and also the most uh, suffering? I sincerely thank you for this, uh, for this question, which really is in my heart. 
this is one of the challenge, the modern challenge we have. This is why I'm one of the people that advocate for a better social protection that every single household, particularly the lower, the bottom of, of the, the, the income pyramid, need to have a minimum packages of protections. If you look at the COVID, the impact of COVID, yes, the economy is recovering. Yes, the jobs are coming back. However, the inequality that the COVID has generated remain there on that. And it's again the poorest that take the brunt of it. The, the, so it is important for us to put in place at the international, regional, and national level mechanism to ensure there's a minimum social protection addressing um, those shocks, addressing those crises. Gilbert Humble, president of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or EFAD. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Looking forward to seeing you soon in the near future.